Uh, thanks, everybody, and, and thanks for having me here, and thanks, thanks for being here, especially thanks to those who, for whom this is not a course requirement, showing up anyway. Uh, when I advertised this talk, uh, the tagline I used was, will audio processing be next to be steamrollered by deep learning? Uh, the answer is yes, in my humble opinion, but you might want to stick around to find out why I think that. And um, I also want to try to convince you that it's an interesting field of study for uh, anybody who's interested in deep learning, machine learning. Lots, lots of good stuff uh, happening. Uh, me, uh, I describe myself as an early abandoner of, of AI, as you heard in the introduction. I'm a software entrepreneur. I'm, I'm between startups right now. Uh, and in the last year or two, I've gotten uh, kind of back to my technical roots by picking up what's going on in the world of machine learning uh, AI. I used to do computer vision, satellite image stuff, that, that kind of thing, uh, but took, took quite a break from that. But now I'm back into it, and, and it's really fun. Uh, I've done a certain amount of audio and, and video work. These are some of my, my products uh, that I've done in the past. And uh, I'm not really an expert at this stuff. I'm an outsider who's self-taught about these things. But I find that that works OK if you're trying to make a, a product. I'm not trying to be a researcher. I'm trying to be a, a practitioner. So uh, today I want to uh, talk a little bit about what have been some of the successes of deep learning and what does that mean for audio processing. And uh, then I want to talk about a lot of different results related specifically to audio. There's a lot of material in here, so I'm going to kind of both keep an eye on the clock and try to gauge your reaction about how much uh, depth to go on. Uh, with anything. Uh, I absolutely encourage you to interrupt me at any time with questions or comments or, or anything. Uh, it'll be uh, much more interesting for everybody if we, we can keep a little bit uh, interactive. So this is just a laundry list of things that deep learning, when people talk about deep learning, these are some of the things they're thinking about uh, where in, in really just the last few years there's been tremendous uh, successes. Uh, the, the left column there is all these things to do with images, and, and today we're going to focus mostly on that because that's closest to what's going on in the audio world. But on the right, you see you know, speech recognition, language, all those other things as well. I see NLP, or I say NLP, uh, sort of natural language processing, because there's also a question hanging over that. Is, is deep learning going to steamroller over everything that's going on in, in NLP? And uh, the jury's still out on that. But uh, I want to look at all this from the perspective of what can we learn from all this uh, for audio. And what do I mean by audio processing? Uh, there's lots of different applications where the things I'm talking about today could play a role. Uh, the one I'm particularly interested in is hearing aids, uh, trying to make a better hearing aid using these uh, technologies. And I could talk for an hour about all the problems with hearing aids and what needs to be done, but I'll mostly stick to the, the technology here. The uh, list of things on the right-hand side, the tasks, they're useful for almost all these different applications. And one of the things I think that makes uh, audio applications a little bit challenging is that you have to make progress on, on that whole long list of things, basically, before you've got a, an end-to-end -end system that's really going to work. So let's start with image classification and uh, ImageNet, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. But this is the thing that really kicked off this current wave of new results in uh, deep learning. Uh, and I want to focus on Immunet just for a second, just because it's very relevant to the world of audio and makes an interesting contrast to what's happening there. So ImageNet is both a, a collection of data, a whole bunch of images with labels on them in a thousand different classes, uh, but it's also a competition with uh, very clear criteria for what it takes to, to win the competition. And uh, it's, that's held every year. Uh, each year, uh, somebody wins. And the errors have been going down dramatically sometime around 2015. Uh, the computer's ability to classify these images actually outstrip human beings' capabilities uh, in terms of accuracy. It was around 2012 where the, those bars changed color when deep learning techniques took over from standard computer vision techniques. Or I'll call them traditional computer vision techniques. So if I use the words traditional here, I just mean stuff before deep learning. Uh, don't, nobody should take offense by that. Um, and basically, yeah, around 2012, deep learning won one image net and uh, never looked back. Uh, and the results continue to get better and better. So what does this mean for audio? Well, the specific techniques of classifying images 
might have a, a role to play for audio. There are cases where we want to identify what was that sound that we just heard. If you're in a car, you want to know, is that sound, was it a siren or was it uh, you know, somebody honking at you or was it just like traffic noise, for example. But I think the real lesson from uh, ImageNet is that if you take the right problem and you make the right data available for it, it can propel the whole field forward. And, um, and I don't want to overstate it, but I think ImageNet was really instrumental in, in kicking off all, all these results that uh, we've seen being so dramatically uh, good in the world of image uh, analysis uh, and using deep learning. Now, there are audio competitions uh, out there. Chime, Reverb, there's a few other things. I'm guessing you've all heard of ImageNet, but you haven't heard of any of these other competitions. So the audio community has a little bit of a, a marketing uh, challenge there. Uh, none of those has quite caught on the way that, that ImageNet has. Uh, in terms of the, the data side of things, though, there is some good news on the audio side. There are many, many data sets, and people have been working on audio problems and speech processing problems for decades, and over that time, they've accumulated lots and lots of uh, good data. Uh, unfortunately, some of that data is a little hard to get, uh, particularly like for an independent researcher like myself who's not associated with a, an academic institution or otherwise sort of connected in. Uh, it's a little bit behind a paywall that's, that's hard to get through. But uh, there's, uh, what's that? Uh, yeah, it won't get you past the paywalls for, uh, for the data, though. It'll get you past paywalls for other things. Not that I would ever use such websites. <laughs> but uh, the good news is there are uh, open source uh, sources of audio, which are kind of uh, spectacularly good for the type of applications that I'm going to talk about uh, today. There's a, a website out there called LibriVox. You may or may not have heard of that, but it's people who just volunteer to re make uh, public domain recordings of public domain books. There's like 10,000 books that people have recorded on there, and these are like full-length novels, lots of them. So they can be five, ten hours long, maybe longer. And they explicitly say, this, this, inf this is all public domain. Do whatever you want with it. Uh, so many, many uh, hundreds of thousands of hours of uh, recordings there. Uh, so um, somebody had the bright idea that this could be a good data set for doing uh, research, particularly with respect to speech, speech recognition, that kind of thing. And uh, so they went through and they got a thousand hours of uh, this speech, uh, all in English. There are other languages there, but they just stuck to English uh, for this. 16 kilohertz, that's actually pretty good quality. Uh, but the real effort that they put into it, and the important thing they did, was to take the text um, of that and uh, carefully align it with all that audio. Uh, and that was, a, that was a kind of a tour de force, but it, very important. What's great about the LibriVox is because they're reading from known books that are readily available, we've got the ground truth words that go with the audio. So that's cool. Anyway. Liver speech is out there. It's, it's a big data set. It's very high quality. It's, it's uh, licensed in a very friendly way. And as we'll talk about in, in a minute, it, we, if we want to take, it's nice clean speech in liver speech because it's all closely recorded. People mics close to their, their mouths. If we want to add noise to that, background noise, you know, simulate what it's like to be in a coffee shop and what you might hear, that kind of thing. Uh, there's lots of sources of that kind of noise for reasons I don't fully understand. People will set up a microphone on the street or in a coffee shop or somewhere else, just let it record for like a couple of hours and then upload this to, to YouTube. Uh, maybe, I guess some people like to work with coffee shop sounds or something, so they put that on as background. So the good news is, again, audio, there's, there's lots of data available to us. Okay, back to uh, images and, and image classification. Uh, this is a, a great example and, and one of the few that we have of uh, transfer learning. These networks that win the ImageNet competitions are generally made available for people to uh, access, but uh, not just the, the code for the network, but the actual trained networks. All the weights that have been learned um, are, are there. And 
there's many, many applications where people will uh, take a pre-trained network and they'll grab results from you know, somewhere in the middle of the network and do something with that, uh, as opposed to just, and they'll replace the back end. So the, the end result they want is not necessarily a, the classification of the image. Instead, they want uh, to have this representation of what's in the image as learned by the network. And so I make the statement here that we've learned a lot about the structure of natural images uh, from this. What do I mean that we, we know something? I mean in the sense that we have this reusable representation of images, which is pretty abstract. We don't really know what's going on inside the network, and, and there's lots of things that people do to try to understand that better. Uh, but, you know, it works, and there's these intermediate representations that prove useful in other uh, domains. So apparently we're learning something that's real about these images and the applications, generalized images that the network has never seen before. So there's, there's just something about natural images that, that we know. That's not really the case for audio. We're not at that stage yet. Uh, and I often get the question when people find out I'm working on audio, oh, what's the, what's the equivalent of ImageNet for audio? And there isn't. And, you know, what's the equivalent of pre-trained network for audio? And I'm, I'm not really aware. In specific circumstances, sure, there's, there's some reuse. There's some speech recognition models that, that you can sort of get off the shelf. But so in the sense that we have learned a lot about natural images, it would be great if we could also have a, a model of clean speech and in some sense to use. And we'll see some of the work we'll talk about today is headed in that direction. Uh, it's worth uh, reminding ourselves why it is that deep learning is having such an impact these days and then ask the question, what does that mean for audio? Uh, first thing is there's lots of data. We're in the world of big data now. And uh, that is an important uh, angle here. It's also um, a good fit for these neural networks because they're very high capacity models. They're the way that we can take in tons and tons of data and get better and better more uh, traditional techniques where we're doing <clears throat> physical modeling or other kinds of sort of handcrafted features, it's hard to just take in a whole bunch of data and do anything with that. Uh, instead, we rely on our ability to do the modeling well. So lots of data. Uh, the hardware's gotten better. The rise of GPUs uh, for this is, is well known and, and plays a huge role uh, in it. And anybody can now have this very powerful GPU in their home for $1,000. Uh, the net of that is that it's made experimentation much more feasible in the world of, um, of deep learning. The, uh, the very little secret about deep learning, which is not a secret at all, which is that w there's not a great theoretical foundation for almost everything. It just works way better in practice than in theory. And the way we get better at it has a lot to do with doing a lot of experiments and just getting empirical results and making choices because this thing works better than this as opposed to having a good, a good understanding. Um, everybody who does deep learning would love to have that understanding and lots of people are chipping away at that. But the reality is it's, it, it's, a, it's an experimental science right now. So what does it all, all mean for audio? Is, is it ripe for deep learning? Well, uh, yes, deep learning has, has shown that it's generally good for signal processing problems. And that's, that's what audio is. I'm calling uh, images signal processing. Yep, go ahead. So the, the question is, is um, what we've seen with deep learning is that it's learned the features, the network's learned features that previously had to be handcrafted, and are we seeing the same thing for audio? Uh, not yet. I mean, a little bit. Uh, and we'll see some of the, uh, uh, the successes in audio deep learning, and, and there are some, for sure. Uh, it's that same observation applies. Uh, people are not handcrafting the features that are being used. Instead, the network is learning them. Uh, okay, so uh, deep learning is generally good for this type of problem, so we, do, we should expect good things. We have lots of labeled data. Uh, there's an asterisk on that. Um, the asterisk is we have lots of uh, data if we're allowed to synthesize the data, by which I mean, uh, say the problem we want to do is to take noisy or a noisy recording of speech and clean it up so we just have clean speech. 
Well, uh, the ground truth for that would be the, a clean speech uh, recording. And uh, we have lots and lots of clean speech recordings. I just mentioned liberal speech. There's many others. Uh, but it's also easy to add noise to that in a pretty convincing way. Uh, physics is on our side here. If you have a couple of noise sources combining together, they combine, they just add up. It's just a linear uh, superposition of those signals. Uh, so if we have, if we want to have a couple of people talking with some background noise, we can take those separate sources and just mix them together. And that's, that's not a bad uh, proxy for just recording out in the real world. It's not exactly the same, and it's not guaranteed that by learning on the synthesized data that it will generalize to uh, real recordings. There's many different kinds of noise, sure, yes. And, but most of the ones that you care about, there's some semblance of, of there's some recording that's probably a good proxy for that. So, uh, so we can add noise that way. I mentioned reverb here, just you know, room echo. There's lots of models of rooms, and, and uh, people uh, can pretty convincingly synthesize the effect of reverb. If you go into any standard audio editor, you'll have a choice of 20 different rooms. Do you want to record something that's very flat and clean, but make it sound like it was recorded in a cathedral? Yeah, you, you can just flip a button, and it runs a filter over it, and it does that. So the, the forward problem of starting with clean speech and making degraded and speech with artifacts, that's, that's pretty well known how to do that well. What deep learning wants to do is, is to do, do the reverse, but it means we've got lots of ground truth to work with. Uh, and the other thing that's going uh, in favor of audio is that we have all these image techniques that may or may not apply to audio. We've got lots of people working on image stuff. Maybe we can just uh, steal all that stuff. Oh, I'll mention this business of synthesizing data for audio. That's an advantage of audio over images. It's, we don't have a great way to synthesize images in any way that's very convincing about what's out there in the real world. You can fuzz them up and stuff, and you can apply, I suppose, lens filter type things, but not nearly as much. And people don't do it as much as they, as they do in the audio world. Okay, so, yes. Yes. Well, I'm thinking about a few different applications. Uh, I'm not talking much about speech recognition today. That's that's a different area, and it's one where there's actually been deep learning has helped a lot. But I'm thinking more of, again, if we think of the hearing aid type of uh, ultimate application, that's one where you need to solve problems of reducing noise and separating sources in, you know, from complex mixtures um, and, and generally enhancing speech. Those, those are the kind of applications I have in mind. All right, so how is audio like images and, and how is it not like, like images? Uh, when we work with audio, we work with it in one of two possible ways. We have the, uh, the time domain recording. This is the, the thing that is recorded on, you know, when you, I guess you go to Spotify and listen to something, it's sending a, a time domain signal down to your earbuds. Um, it's just sampling the amplitude of the signal at regular time steps. Then there's the spectrogram shown on the right there. This is where uh, over little time windows, you calculate the frequencies uh, of, and the magnitude or amplitude, amount of energy at each frequency bin uh, at that time and see how that evolves over time. So the x-axis is time, the y-axis is frequency, and the colors are the, the magnitude of um, uh, the energy that's at that frequency at that time. There's, uh, there's not like debate exactly within the community about these, but people will use one or the other uh, approach. Uh, certainly approaches based on spectrograms and traditional pro pro uh, processing have been very uh, popular and there's a ton of work that's, that's done that way. Uh, the time domain is, has generally not been thought of as a good place to do uh, processing uh, and that the frequencies are more you know, closer to what's interesting about sound and where you need to be manipulating things. So lots of that. Uh, the uh, reference at the bottom there, comparing time and frequency domain for audio event recognition using deep learning. 
they did, uh, they looked at a specific task. They concluded that, in fact, uh, the frequency domain was better uh, in their particular case. And um, that it, uh, that's, that's the one you should focus on. And there's lots of studies that way. But there's, there's things that go either way. And we'll see some interesting results in the time domain pretty soon as well. So one of the challenges with using spectrograms is that you end up sort of throwing out half your data. And this is the challenge of phase. So audio has both amplitude and phase. And a spectrogram, I mean, the good news about it is uh, this time domain and the spectrogram, they're equivalent in the sense that you can go from one to the other and back again perfectly. But you can do that perfectly only if you keep the complex values of the spectrogram. So you apply a Fourier transform, you're going to get complex values out of that. That's fine. You keep all that, then you can, you can do the inverse Fourier transform and you'll get back to where you started. That's great. However, the typical processing scenario has been for a long time is you, you start in the time domain, you make your spectrogram, but then you split your spectrogram into the amplitude spectrogram and the phase spectrogram. You don't do anything with the phase because it's too hard to work with. You do some modification of the amplitude spectrogram, maybe you find some noise, get rid of it there. Then when you want to get back to create your output signal, you take the original phase, combine it with your modified amplitude spectrogram, and then invert that to get your signal. Now that sounds like kind of a bad idea because we're taking like bad phase information and reusing it. Yeah, everyone kind of knows it's a bad idea. So what, but you know, you kind of get used to it in a way uh, just for practical reasons. What, what can you do about that? Well, you could modify this phase spectrogram, but it's too hard. It, there's just not a lot of structure there. We don't have a good way to, to deal with that very noisy. You could, in fact, work with a complex spectrogram end to end. And I haven't seen a lot of that being done in, in traditional processing techniques, but in some of the deep learning uh, approaches, they do that. Instead of taking real values into the network and doing something, they'll take complex values and, and trace that all the way through. I, I've just given some links here. I won't go into a lot of detail about that. But uh, they're getting some, you know, okay results. Uh, it's early days for that. It's not as simple as you might think. Like, it sounds like, well, it's just complex numbers and there's just twice as many of them. How hard can it be? But all the things that you use in, in deep networks in terms of loss functions and, and activations and so on all of a sudden takes on a slightly different flavor when, when things are complex. Uh, mostly because real numbers are ordered and complex numbers are not ordered. However, they figure it out. The third thing that you can do is to work in the time domain. Just work with that time domain signal. Uh, forget about going to the spectrogram at all. Uh, this has its own challenges because there's like tons of data there. A, a high quality recording is being recorded at 44.1 kilohertz. Uh, so you're gonna get thousands of samples uh, every second or even over the small fraction of a second you might be doing analysis on. You're still getting with thousands and thousands of samples. And the interesting stuff happens over many different time scales. If you've got high frequency things going on, that's fine. They will uh, occur over a relatively small number of samples and you can, you can detect that. If it's low frequency, that's spread way out. And uh, you know, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Okay, well, let me, uh, let me leave that thought for a minute. And as you'll see, I have to kind of skip around topics a little bit. It would prove impossible to do, do a sort of a linear pass through all these topics. Um, but uh, we'll come back to the, some of those thoughts in a minute. Okay, convolutional neural networks. Again, I'm sure everyone in this room is very familiar with these, but it's worth thinking about them from the perspective of audio processing. So CNNs have been just spectacularly successful for images. And why is that? Well, uh, the weights are sparse. In a, in a CNN, uh, there's a translation variant, like the, the feature that might be interesting, it could occur anywhere in the image, and fine, CNNs are capable of handling that. And it makes an economic use, use of weights. So there's a lot of weight sharing. So it means you can have a relatively small number of parameters, still in the millions probably, but not billions or trillions that you might have to if you had uh, you know, fully uh, filled in non-sparse uh, kernels that you were dealing with. But why does that work for images? Why is it so successful? Well, the reason is that images have local coherency. The value of a pixel at this point has a lot to do with the, the pixels that are right around it. Uh, and, you know, less to do with things that are farther away uh, from it. 
the, uh, there's a certain symmetry in the X and Y directions. Images, if you, if you take one and rotate it by 90 degrees, it still looks like an image. It may look, the horizon's now looking funny, but, you know, it still looks like a natural image. And as far as the computer's concerned, you know, that's still, it's still good. So there's, there's that symmetry. Um, the image semantics, um, like what is it that we're looking at in this image, seems to be kind of hierarchical, uh, and we'll see that here. So as we go deeper into a, a CNN uh, network, convolutional network, where uh, each layer of that network is looking at more of the input uh, pixels, ultimately, because it's sort of aggregating these things as we go through the network, and it's learning higher level uh, features as it, as it goes. So at the lowest level, it, at the first layer of the network, you're seeing edges, and then you're seeing uh, maybe textures, patterns, and you get higher level things. You can compose those together at the end, and that's what lets you identify what's going on there. And uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, the CNNs, they, they learn the features themselves. That's very nice. So what does all this mean uh, for audio? Well, if you're in the time domain, uh, a convolution makes sense. It'll be a one-dimensional convolution, but it still uh, makes a reasonable amount of sense there. You've got local coherency. The features that you might be interested in will be, could occur anywhere in the time uh, stream, so you want that, that kind of convolution effect to happen there, so that's all good. What about the uh, spectrogram? Can't, it looks like an image, right? Why can't we just take all these image results and just use it uh, on the spectrogram? Well, some people do with you know, some success, but it's probably not gonna be the very best way to do it because uh, the X and Y axes here are not symmetrical. They don't have the same kind of information behavior. You've got time running this way and it could be as long as you want. In the frequency dimension, you've got actually pretty, pretty low resolution there, typically 129 frequencies or something like that. Plus, the coherence in the y direction between frequencies is not the same as it is through time or, or in an image x, y, uh, because you have harmonics. You've got your, your uh, base frequency, and then you've got harmonics at multiples of, of that. So there's some long term relationship or long, you know, well, across you know, long distance relationships that are important for understanding the structure of that sound if you're, if you're trying to think of it that way. So that makes it all sound like I'm, I'm leaning toward doing time domain processing. You're right. Uh, this paper that uh, came out last year, uh, WaveNet, really caught a lot of attention, has been extremely influential in a lot of audio processing that's happened uh, since then. And you'll notice the time frame I'm talking about for a lot of these audio results is quite recent, within the last year or so. There are things in this uh, presentation today that just came out a few days ago. Uh, and there's things where I, I said, gee, why, how, how come nobody's done this? And then the next day it shows up on archive that somebody's tried it. Okay, so WaveNet. Um, WaveNet uh, is, I think, a little bit unusual in, in where it came from because the authors were first interested in coming up with a model for natural images. That's had much less impact than when they took that approach and applied it to audio. And their best results have been uh, for uh, text-to-speech, for synthesizing audio. So uh, they're very interested in, in generating audio that sounds realistic. Everything's done in the time domain. And the general idea is they have a probabilistic model for speech. So uh, X here is, is that's our uh, a signal of, of natural speech. They're saying, okay, we want to discover, learn the probability density of, of X based on, at, you know, at a particular time T, based on everything that's happened before that. That's the, the structure of the probability that they want to, to learn and discover. Uh, they did a couple of very innovative things along the way. Uh, dilated convolution, which we'll talk about in a second. They didn't invent that, but they, they certainly, I think, popularized it uh, for many. Uh, we'll see about that. They also treated the audio sample values as, as discrete values as opposed to continuous. Almost all work up to this point, whether it's probabilistic or otherwise, would, would say, okay, the amplitude that we're seeing, it could be any floating point number where, uh, you know, uh, we're sampling from a continuous signal. They're saying, you know, in reality, you have... You, you quantize when you do that um, sampling, and it works out better to actually think of these as um, qu 
quantized uh, samples with uh, discrete values, not, not continuous. So uh, dilated convolutions, uh, so I'm assuming everyone knows what regular convolutions are like. Dilated convolutions are those where as you uh, go up uh, the layers, and this, this is like a sort of, a, think of this as a single convolution operation even though you're seeing multiple layers. Uh, so you might look at, at uh, from the input layer, you'll look at a couple of uh, pixels perhaps. The kernels are typically two in size. So you're looking at a couple of, or samples, not pixels, but a couple of samples side by side all the way along. The next layer, again, you're looking at two samples, but now they're spaced apart by two, and then by four, and then by eight. So you have this exponential sparsity that you introduce. And it means that it, within a relatively few layers, you're now looking at a whole bunch of the input. Um, versus if you stack up normal convolution layers, you're getting kind of a linear increase in what your receptive field is and how much of the input is influencing your results. With these dilated convolutions, now you're seeing, you're seeing much more. So that's good news. Uh, remember, we're in the time domain here with, with WaveNet, and I was saying before about the time domain that you want to, um, you have to take care of the fact that interesting things happen potentially across very long time scales. And this, this is a way to, to get at that. So the architecture here, uh, I won't go into great detail on this, but there's, um, so you get these uh, convolutions down here, you stack them up, you, you put in a um, residual blocks. This is like uh, recurrent neural networks uh, type of a, a style. So that is gonna capture some of what's going on as, as this signal evolves through time. And you feed all this finally into a softmax, and that's where you make your, your prediction as to what the next sample value would be based on what you've seen before. Okay, so they did a bunch of things with that. Uh, let me play you some uh, examples. Finally, you'll get to hear some audio. Uh, and they, uh, these examples uh, came out with their paper last year. And they're comparing here with a couple of uh, standard ways that people have used to generate uh, speech uh, before. And uh, today on your phone, uh, probably this, this middle and concatenative is, is what you could do. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. It's not terrible, but it's, it's, it's kind of computer-ish. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. And here's, uh, here's WaveNet. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. In this room, it's, the, the differences are a little bit subtle, but believe me, if you're listening with headphones or closely, uh, it's, it's quite dramatically better. No, these are, these are synthesizing speech from text and so it's a generative model of, of speech. So it's, it's text to speech. And um, the thing you're trying to do is to do that in a way that sounds like a human rather than like a, a computer. Uh, there isn't a, an objective measure of that. That's a great question. We'll come back to lots of performance measure. It's just right now it's just subjective listening is, is how, we, how we decide that it's good. Sure. Uh, well, um, no, not, <clears throat> excuse me, not, not so much. But um, we'll, we'll kind of come back to that because it's actually a, a difficult question as to how, what is the objective measure for, for quality speech. Uh, I'll give you another example here and then we'll, we'll move on to other things. Um, okay, parametrics this is a couple of years ago. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. A little more recent. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. And then uh, wave that. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. So again, in this room, not, I mean, these previous techniques were not terrible. If we went back 10 years, yeah, that, you'd really, really notice. But uh, wave that does sound significantly better, uh, for sure. So that was a year ago. The problem was to generate those uh, sound samples took an enormous amount of time and, and computing power. 
it was many, I don't know, I think minutes per second of output audio that it would, that it would take. I won't play all of these, but um, recently they published uh, more, and now they're at uh, 20 times real time in terms of the generation capability, so it's, it's very fast. And uh, A single WaveNet can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. A single WaveNet can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. Now, it's fast. Now, <laughs> it's very fast. I'll, I'll do one more, just, uh, I think this is a different type of voice. Well, actually, I'll do the Japanese voice, just to indicate that it can do many different types of voices. ひとつのウェーブネットのみで多数の異なる話者の音声波形を極めて正確にモデル化できます。今回、ウェーブネットによる音声波形生成を劇的に高速化しました。I don't know Japanese, but I think the last part was now it's fast. Um, so, uh, again, you, you, to really appreciate this, you'd have to sort of go online and listen to it. But you'll, this will be, the new WaveNet will be in your Android phone sh soon, and uh, you'll probably notice a significant improvement um, in, in that context. All right. Back to images. What are the, some of the other things we do with images? Uh, well, we started out by classifying things. And uh, that evolved into detecting objects uh, within images. Uh, images are not just one thing. They're collections of things, typically. So that's good. And that evolved into very fast techniques for classifying things with, within a video. This is the sort of thing you might want to uh, be important for like a self-driving car, to be able to recognize pedestrians versus bicycles versus storefronts and that, that kind of thing. Uh, the main point to bring this up is, is there a relevance to audio here? Maybe a little bit. Speaker diarization, is what you do if you have a recording of a few people and you want to track uh, one speaker uh, and keep track of what that person is doing and separate that out from what the other person is saying, that sort of thing. Uh, so those sort of tracking techniques might be valuable there. But the bigger picture is that we started with ImageNet. We're classifying these images. Let's face it, that's a little bit of a toy problem. If that's all we could do, it doesn't really solve any real world problem. But having worked on those problems, now all of a sudden we're helping our cars drive themselves. Uh, so super important. Some of the things I'll talk about for audio, you'll kind of wonder, well, it seems like that's not very important if we could do that. These things do lead to much more interesting, uh, interesting results. Image segmentation takes this even a step farther now idea of object detection. And this is now getting closer to things we actually want to do for audio. So in the case of image segmentation, what we want to do is to uh, not just identify object in the image, but label every pixel in the image as to what class it's in. So on the left-hand side, we're seeing, again, something that might apply to a self-driving car situation. The different colors represent different categories of things in that scene. Uh, roads, trees, cars, uh, lights. I don't actually see any people there. Oh, there's some people. Yep, people. Um, this also has applications in uh, medical uh, imaging. You want to distinguish what are the boundaries of cells and distinguish different types of cells from uh, one another. So um, there's a technique that has become very popular just in the last couple of years for doing that kind of image segmentation, and we're going to see it showing up in audio a lot, so I'm going to take a second to talk about it. It goes by a couple of names. Uh, they're related. Uh, fully Convolutional Network, FCN, or UNET, uh, UNET seems to be the name that's sort of winning because it's shorter and it's got a pretty picture that goes along with it. So what's going on uh, here is that uh, we have uh, convolutional networks. Uh, we take our input image. It goes into uh, a few layers of a convolutional network. But then we make it smaller, typically through max pooling. We'll lose some spatial dimension. But at the same time, we're increasing the frequency dimension here. So Whereas we said, this is like for a, uh, just a grayscale image, so we've only got one feature layer, like the gray level values here, one dimension there. But uh, in our convolutional layer, we, we do 64 uh, filters, 64 features, and continuous 64. At the same time, we reduce the spatial dimension. We increase by a factor of two each way. We increase the feature dimension by a factor of two. So we're actually doing dimensionality reduction, because it's two squared versus two. Uh, um, we're losing spatial information, but we're gaining information about features. 
So you, you repeat, 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 you go through this bottleneck down here, but then you go back up the other side and you basically do reverse kind of operations uh, all the way through. So you're uh, on the one hand decreasing the number of features, 512 here down to 256, um, and uh, at the same time you're increasing the, the spatial resolution. There's a number of different ways that you can upsample the resolution to, uh, to the next uh, size. And those, typically those uh, ways are, are learned as part of the network. It learns how to do the upsampling as part of all this. The net result of all this is that you had an image of a certain size going in. You get another image of a different size coming out. The image coming out is the, the one where all the pixels are just a few colors representing the classes, but it, it's the same size. So very different from the classification problem where you have an image in and then just a label coming out. This is image in, image out. So that's very relevant to audio because uh, we're typically wanting to clean up some audio and the output we want is, is audio. We don't want a, a label on it. So these kind of transformation problems, the in image to image transformations have a direct bearing on uh, sort of audio to audio transformations. And we'll see they get, they get used a lot. Things like a, a denoising, uh, source separation, those kind of problems in audio are essentially uh, segmentation problems. If you've got two people talking, you want to uh, segment, uh, you sort of want to label everything as is it person A or person B that, that's talking now. And uh, I mentioned a couple things there, but we'll see, we'll see more there. So let's, let's um, okay, we're going to park that thought. We're going to talk about noise reduction, then we'll come back to what units uh, have to do with that. So noise reduction is a very classic thing to want to do with audio signals. The traditional way to do it is you open up your favorite audio editor and you open up the file. The stuff that's here at the left is an example of, of the noise. This is actually a person talking in, sort of, we'll hear this a little later, but a person talking with some coffee shop kind of background noise that you want, to, you want to get rid of. At the beginning, the person isn't talking, so we've got a nice little segment here where it's just coffee shop noise. So you select that segment and you say, okay, I, I don't, you probably can't see this. This says capture noise print. So you, you tell the, the, uh, the application, this is the, the noise. Then it says, okay, um, here's what I learned about that noise. And you, you have all these knobs and dials that you can turn to uh, adjust how it's going to apply a correction based on that noise. That, that graph of the little dots that you can probably barely see in the middle. Yeah, not at all. Uh, anyways, the frequency response of the noise. And it, it looks kind of flat because the noise is pretty nondescript. And in fact, uh, if you then say, okay, go ahead, it, it makes almost no difference. So what it, the kind of noise reduction that works with traditional techniques is not the kind of noise reduction where you get rid of coffee shop sounds. It's more, um, <clears throat> you know, if we look at the spectrogram of that, that same image, one of the things you might be able to see is uh, like across the middle here, we have this pretty bright line. That means that at that frequency, there's this kind of steady pitch, hum, squeal, something like that. Uh, this technique would be good for getting rid of stuff like that. But if you look at the beginning of the file, there's this basically nondescript mush of different frequencies and things, and it can't really can't really do uh, much with that to, to help you out. So this is um, the, the, the technique that gets used in your typical audio editor is a uh, spectral subtraction uh, or some variation on that. That's evolved over the years. It can do a great job in very specific kinds of noise, but it can't solve the problem that we want to solve, which is to get rid of ambient confusing sounds. So uh, back to WaveNet now for a second here. Uh, what can we use WaveNet to help us uh, denoise speech? Um, so these folks uh, took some of the WaveNet concepts. This doesn't look very much like WaveNet anymore, but uh, bear with me for a second here. So on the left, we have <clears throat> a noisy uh, speech fragment that feeds into this uh, pyramid. These, this is the dilation, uh, dilated convolution cell that's happening there. They've got skip connections, blah, blah, blah. It goes over here. Uh, Denoise uh, samples come out uh, the end. So they're using, the, the main thing they've taken from WaveNet is this dilated convolution idea. 
the um, the L1, or the loss on, on the uh, samples, and this is a little bit of the question that you asked earlier, in this case, it's just an L1 loss. They're just looking at the absolute difference uh, between their clean speech and their reconstructed speech. Um, they're actually using non-causal convolutions. So when I showed you the WaveNet thing, it was always looking backwards to do those convolutions. This looks forwards and backwards. That, that helps. Um, they do several at once. It doesn't really matter. I say it's mostly not like WaveNet because really, they kept changing things from WaveNet, and by the time you get to the end, you've got dilated convolutions, and that's about it. There's a fully convolutional architecture, though. Uh, they don't do any pre-processing, and, and it's end-to-end -end in the sense that you've got audio in, audio out. Everything in between is what you're training uh, and what it's going to do. Uh, so there's some sort of objective measures. MOS is actually human beings listening to it and rating it as to how well they like it, and then these numbers mean that they like I like the WaveNet version uh, better. Uh, I'll play it for you in a second, but let's go back to this uh, sample. I just look at it in the, uh, the time domain, and what we're getting out of this is that um, that's, the, that's the noise. Now, if we apply their way of doing the noise reduction, all that stuff, like in particular over here at the beginning, like it just gets clamped down to, to almost nothing. And the stuff in between where there was the background noise, and I'll sort of flip back and forth a little bit here, you can see it's done something pretty dramatic uh, to, that, to that sound. Okay, Dra dramatic is not always good. Uh, let's see, and again, I think these things are gonna be a little bit subtle. Um, so I'll play the noisy uh, first. Uh, Wiener refers to a Wiener filter, a traditional kind of approach to doing noise reduction, and then we'll see what their, uh, their WaveNet version did. Some have accepted it as a miracle without physical explanation. So a little hard to hear maybe, but he's talking over uh, some background noise of, uh, I think there was some music in a coffee shop, something like that. Okay, here's a traditional Wiener filter. Some have accepted it as a miracle without physical explanation. You can still hear a lot of that background stuff going on there, even in, in this room. Some have accepted it as a miracle without physical explanation. Uh, you, see, you hear a touch of the background, but much, much suppressed. Uh, what you probably can't hear in this room if you're listening more closely is that the uh, the voice is definitely has artifacts on it though of, a, of a, an odd type that you probably haven't heard before. Let's let's one more example and we'll move on. It may well have been. Maybe not that one. However, at the intensive care unit at the Southern General yeah, Hospital, not that one I was furious. I was furious. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go to this one. It may well have been. Some playground noise in the background there. It may well have been. Um, the thing you can't hear in the Wiener thing is you get this sort of garbly musical type of distortion that happens as well. It sounds like the person's talking underwater. Uh, that is gone with the wavelet. It may well have been. Again, a little hard to hear in these circumstances, but uh, WaveNet is definitely doing better at noise suppression, but it's adding its own kind of artifacts to it. Still a very, uh, very interesting uh, approach. This next paper uh, is one that I really wanted to love, and I'm still trying to love it. Uh, I like the approach that they're doing. Uh, I'm not completely convinced by what they've done, but uh, let's talk about it for a second here. So they want to use WaveNet, and they want to take this Bayesian approach to doing uh, noise reduction. Uh, their, their philosophy, I think, is pretty great. The old way of doing noise reduction, which we saw when I was in the audio editor, is you want to model the noise find that noise within your signal and then suppress it. And they're saying, no, let's, let's turn that around. Let's instead, let's model what clean speech sounds like or is, and um, anything that's not speech, we'll call it noise, and we're gonna enhance the speech rather than suppressing the noise. So they have a, a probabilistic speech model uh, building on the one that uh, WaveNet has, and they're eventually gonna learn the, the, the prior model and, and the likelihood model from, from the data. So their probabilistic model here is they want to uh, come up with a uh, probability distribution for uh, clean speech, that's X, conditioned on the, pre uh, prediction, the previous predictions of the clean speech. So it's, again, this um, incremental thing that they'll do. And uh, Y, which is the observations of the, the noisy speech. So through the magic of Bayes, they can split that up into these two models, the prior model and likelihood model, and they train those independently uh, and then uh, combine them together uh, after that. So uh, 
this is, believe it or not, looks like WaveNet. Now let's, let's listen to the examples, and uh, these are going to sound a bit strange. So first of all, the noisy example, and then we'll hear their, their cleaned up version. She then spoke of the letter repeating the whole of its contents as far as they concerned George. That's very annoying. Uh, it's also not the type of noise you typically want to get rid of, but, but it's also the type of noise that would be super hard to get rid of uh, through many other techniques. So what does it sound like after they clean it up? She then spoke of the letter repeating the whole of its contents as far as they concerned. So I think in this case, uh, you could hear that the clean speech is still, it's, it's pretty scratchy and not spectacular from a quality perspective. It is much more intelligible, though, uh, without that interfering sound. And we'll hear that in a couple of these other ones, too. No more have I, said Mr. Bennett, and I am glad to find that you do not depend. Even if with headphones on, it's really hard to hear what that person is saying because well, somebody's opening scissors next to the microphone, or I don't know what that noise is. So let's, uh, let's try this here. No more have I, said Mr. Bennett, and I am glad to find that you do not dip. So, very scratchy sound, not high quality speech, but very much more intelligible. One more example, and we'll move on. Whether Mrs. Collins has yet expressed a sense of your kindness in coming to us. Whether Mrs. Collins has yet expressed a sense of your kindness in coming to us. So, one person I played this for, they said, well, that sounds pretty terrible. What a, what a waste of time that was. I said, no, you're, you're wrong. Those, that, those type of noises are super hard to, to clean up in any way. And the fact that you get something that's kind of intelligible out of that, this is a good first step. I say I want to love this paper. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear it applied to more realistic kinds of noises, uh, for example. And, um, but th this notion that you can separate out the, the training model where you train first on clean speech, which is this prior, versus the noise, which is specific to the example you want to clean up, that holds out a lot of promise for uh, um, transfer learning. So somebody, Google, who's got lots of resources, could, could give the world a model of clean speech, and then we could use that uh, further. Yes? You, you mean you could obscure what you're saying through all that noise? I'm saying that um, I'm a spy and I've got this technology. So. Uh, probably. There's, there's bad uses for all of these things. Um, but the other thing I would think of, again, in the hearing aid context is, uh, you know, you really want to enhance the speech in the presence of all kinds of interfering sounds. And the notion that, I mean, philosophically why I love it is the notion that speech is this fairly structured kind of sound that we have a chance of modeling well and everything else will suppress, if that program can be made to work, that would be really powerful. Yeah? Uh, mm, as far as I know, no. Now, they did their training on a very limited training set. In fact, they just trained with one person and then the test was on the same person, which is also a reason I'm waiting to see better results. But um, it's, it's likely, but unproven, that you could generalize from one language to another, that speech is probably reasonably similar from language to language. But to best results, I'm sure you'd want to train on several languages. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if it did a perfect job, yeah, it would suppress the horn. Yeah, yeah. So you don't always want to suppress those interfering sounds. Sometimes they're important, for sure. Uh, generative adversarial networks uh, is something where you get kind of spectacular results in the image world. Uh, all these pictures are not real people. These are pictures that were hallucinated by uh, a neural network. And... Uh, they're pretty good. They started with a celebrity database and they just invented a whole bunch of new pictures of people that look like celebrities. And they do, right? You, um, I would say we, we, are, we have passed through the, the shady shadow of the, the valley of uncanniness and, and come up the other side. Although if you look at them long enough, it starts looking a little odd here and there. But that, that, that's pretty amazing. Uh, What's that got to do with audio? Well, lots of things. We want our audio to sound better. 
We want it to sound more realistic. Just like we want those pictures to look realistic, we want our audio to sound realistic. So this uh, paper takes this idea uh, and does speech enhancement using a generative adversarial network. So if you don't know how these, these GANs work, basically there's, there's two networks. There's a piece of it that uh, generates, in this case, generates audio. And then you have a, a discriminator network, which you train to learn what is fake audio from what is real audio. And it's called adversarial because these two things kind of work against each other and you train them back and forth. So the, the generator is trying to fool the discriminator the discriminator is trying to uh, properly detect what the generator has, has given it. Uh, this is all done in the time domain, again. So again, that's, that's pretty interesting. It, it models it end to end, audio in, audio out. And uh, this gets right back to the question of what is the right loss function to use for audio? What, what's our measure of whether it's good audio or not? Um, it's hard to come up with something just sitting down and trying to think of it. So instead, we let this GAN effectively define the loss function for us. That's what it's doing. It's, it's learning the loss function uh, for us. So they uh, trained this up on a whole bunch of things. Um, the generation network here basically is, is a UNET kind of thing. Let's see what we've got uh, here as results of this. Again, don't get your hopes up too high, but it's something. So noisy speech. We were surprised to see the photograph. That's pretty noisy. A traditional uh, noise reduction. Whoop. That didn't work. And on. Uh, right, so let's do the noisy speech again. We were surprised to see the photograph. Traditional. We were surprised to see the photograph. So still lots of noise and lots of garbling. We were surprised to see the photograph. A little bit of garbling, a little bit of leftover noise, but much, much less. Let's, let's do another one. It's too early to say whether a public inquiry would be appropriate. That one's not very noisy. Let me try, let me try this one. He says that he is no different from any other man. He says that he is no different from any other man. He says that he is no different from any other man. The result's not, not dramatic there. Uh, yeah, should have thought that uh, in, in a room like this, it's going to be harder to hear. But again, if you go to their, their website where they have all these examples, uh, the noise is pretty convincing noise. It's, it's realistic. And uh, the Wiener filtering does not do a great job of it. And it adds a lot of its own artifacts. The Sagan results, uh, definitely much less noise and uh, pretty, pretty interesting uh, results there. But early days, lots more work to do. Uh, another thing, and I'll, I'll mention this fairly briefly, where uh, deep learning is having great success with images is um, in painting or filling in gaps, essentially. So uh, you can see that they've just masked out portions of these uh, images and then filled them back in. And if, if you've ever used Photoshop and it's uh, content aware fill, you'll sort of have an idea of what this is trying to do. But if you try to use content aware fill in some of those extreme cases, it won't, it won't work uh, very well at all. Uh, the technique here, again, you'll see this sort of, um, the, the completion network, they call it. Again, it's sort of this UNET uh, type of structure. They do something locally, they do something globally, and uh, it, it really works well. This is a paper that just, just came out. What's this got to do with audio? Uh, there's a very, common source of noise for audio, which is that person recording the audio, probably me today on this thing, it'll, some of it would be too loud. And it just like, the A to D converters can't handle it. They just, they just clamp it at some maximum value. So the, the extent the waveform was above that value, you just, you've lost that information. So effectively, this is just gaps in your data. They happen at irregular intervals, and there's no good model of how to uh, fill those in. You can definitely go to your good audio editors and apply declipping filters, um, they don't work very well. They really don't work very well. It seems like this would be a natural for, for deep learning to be applied here. Uh, but as far as I can tell, nobody's working on it. So there's a problem for you. Uh, if you can solve this, uh, you'll have a good product that people will buy from you.
Mm. Right. Yeah, that would be an interesting application. So you're saying video and, and even just images. You can you can blow out your whites at the the high end, or you can crush all the blacks at the at the low end. Yeah, if you want to add some more dynamic range, maybe there's a, a, a an HDR type of application for something like this. But I don't care about that. I care about audio. I want I want you to fix my clipping distortion, please. Uh, like how many samples in a row are clipped, you mean, or? Uh, you would lose, I mean, obviously there's degrees of severity, but typically 100, 50, 100, couple hundred samples in a row. Out, yeah. Oh, I mean, say, say you're recording at 44 or 48 kilohertz, you, you might lose a few hundred. Uh, samples in a row due to clipping. Uh, yeah, it's oversampled. Well, it depends how high the frequency is you want to capture. But I mean, if you're you know, trying to capture good quality sound, uh, voice or, or music, sure, you might want everything up to 20 kilohertz. So you, so you need that. But clipping distortion is, um, you, you really notice it. It's a very harsh sound very unpleasant to listen to, and it can really ruin uh, a recording. So anything that could clean that up effectively would be good. And I've certainly been guilty of recording, recording uh, stuff with clipping in it, and I tried all the tools out there, and it, it couldn't rescue me. How many samples are clipped? Well, in, in a group, there might be 100 in a row, but out of the whole thing, it's a percent, a couple of percent. I mean, it depends how bad you did it, right? Yeah. No amplitude. Well, I mean, the amplitude gets lost, so effectively you, you're missing samples over some time frame. Okay, I'm going to push on here because uh, there's a couple more things I want to say before I, I wrap up. Uh, super resolution is the idea of taking something low resolution and making it higher resolution. Um, so here they started with, uh, well, the, the image on the right-hand side is the original high resolution image. Image on the left is, they, they dumbed it down by a factor of mm, two or four, probably four. Uh, and then they just zoomed in using a standard technique, which is by qubit convolution. So if you go to any standard image editor and tell it to make your picture bigger, it'll do something like that. They applied a, a, a type of a GAN to this and were able to um, create that picture in the, in the center, which certainly if you look at the details, it's not exactly like the original, but boy, is it ever a lot better. Than the, than the image on the left. It's, it's really quite amazing. There's a website you can go to, enhance.io, where you can upload your own images and it'll upscale them by a factor of four or more. It does a surprisingly good job, depending on the nature of the image. So what's this got to do with audio? Well, uh, oh, and these are more faces. Um, they look good. <laughs> they fuzzy to, to sharp. Uh, so this uh, paper that's referenced in the lower right corner here, uh, also does uh, super resolution, again, a UNet sort of structure, and uh, sort of like an autoencoder, if you're familiar with that term. They talk about maybe this is learning a hierarchy of features, and therefore it's able to kind of reproduce things. You get sort of wavelet type things at the bottom, and you get phonemes at the top. I'm not sure I buy that, but that's fine. Uh, the upsampling I didn't really understand. Um, but look at these uh, spectrograms now of uh, one of their samples. So here we go at the left. This is the original high resolution audio signal. After they dumb it down, and they did use a factor of four here, um, they just killed off all those higher frequencies there. If you do a baseline reconstruction, which is again sort of a cubic interpolation, which is up until recently all that was available to us, 
it does its best to try to recover some of those higher frequencies, but it really doesn't do very, very well. Look at their reconstruction. Look at this. Qualitatively, pretty similar to the original. There's, there's stuff up, up here, like fine uh, structure that they've been able to recapture. Um, quite, quite impressive. Let's, how does it sound? Well, let's see. And I hope we can hear this uh, here. So here's the original high resolution. The incidents are not believed to be linked. Here's a low resolution version. This is after they dumb it down. The incidents are not believed to be linked. So it sounds like you're talking over a bad telephone line. Here's the best we could do previously. The incidents are not believed to be linked. Hardly better at all. Here's their super resolution. The incidents are not believed to be linked. Uh, it's pretty good. Still, it's, it's a little scratchy and there's artifacts, but you obviously recovered a lot of the high frequency information there. So could be important for uh, speech en enhancement where the high frequencies are really important for intelligibility. Style transfer, uh, we've seen this in images. It's amazing. Uh, audio doesn't work. I won't even play it. It's terrible. So if you want to do that, that would be fun. It's one of those toy problems, though, that it's not entirely clear, although the techniques of a style transfer very similar to the techniques for super resolution, so there's your excuse to play around with that. Uh, reverberation, I think you know how this works. Uh, you're in a room, uh, there's, when you talk, there's direct sound into the mic, but then there's reflections from the walls and the doors, and there's reflections from reflections, and uh, in the past, what uh, we've been able to do is, if you've got a good model of the room, if you know exactly the circumstances, you can, you can undo it, and, um, so that was it sounded very echoey, like your typical YouTube video after they apply this this room model. Ah, wouldn't do that. It it sounds really good, really good, but that took a lot of handcrafted models to do it. And that's the, the state of the art when you know a lot about the recording circumstances. Uh, seems to me you could do this for audio, just make the audio sound better with a lot less reverb. I don't think anybody's working on this specifically, so there's another good, good thing for you to, uh, to take on. Uh, and there's a, I suggest an approach here. Uh, people certainly, when they're doing automatic speech recognition, using deep learning techniques, they'll, they'll do things that are robust in the face of this kind of reverb, but I'd also like to actually have a clean signal come out of it. We talked briefly about objective measures. If you're reading the literature, you'll see a couple of them. PESQ, which comes out of the telecoms world, that's a measure of quality. If it, if it sounds good to a human, just like it's good, clean sound, then it's going to have a high, high PESQ. There's a, an alternative measure called STOI, short-term objective intelligibility, which has to do with intelligibility, meaning if you play it to human beings, can they understand the words that are being spoken? You might think these things are the same, they're highly correlated. Surprisingly to me, uh, they're not so much. Um, and you often have a bit of a trade-off between the two. There's techniques where you know, the authors are all happy about it because they did, it, they did well with STOI and well, they actually did worse than the other guys with PESQ. Uh, and this is one of the things that got me interested in this. I wrote a noise reduction program. I was very happy with it. The sound was very clean. It was beautiful. And I realized I couldn't hear the words any better, maybe a little bit worse than before I applied my noise reduction. So then I started looking at intelligibility and uh, one thing led to another. Here I am today. Uh, in my opinion, intelligibility is much more important for various reasons. Uh, STOI, the intelligibility measure, looks to me like it's differentiable, which means it could be part of our loss function and we could train to optimize for a, a high STOI value. Uh, I don't think anybody's doing that. Another project for you. Okay, source separation, we're getting, this is, this is going well, <laughs> time-wise. This is the result that actually got me interested in the whole hearing aid, aid problem. So uh, source separation is this idea that you have a couple of people talking, you're hearing them at the same time. Human beings are pretty good at focusing on one person that they're listening to and kind of tuning out the rest. But if you have hearing loss, that's one of the first capabilities that goes. And so you'll, you'll find people, whether they've got hearing aids on or not, 
who have hearing loss really find it tough in your typical restaurant coffee shop situation or in a, in a meeting where there's just a lot of background noise and interfering talking and so on. Uh, super hard problem. It's the, the cocktail party effect is what uh, you know, humans do well. Computers have never been able to do it very well. This particular technique works on spectrograms. Uh, in fact, the magnitude spectrogram. Uh, at the top here, we're seeing a spectrogram of, of the mixture of speech. And at the bottom, we're seeing it colored in a way that shows how it splits up between the different speakers. Uh, three speakers in this case. And then there's dark blue for just silence when nobody's talking. Now, of course, you've got multiple people talking. They could be talking at exactly the same moment. Uh, and um, what this, these colors represent is who's the loudest at that frequency and at that, that time. So when I talk about a segmentation problem, this is a segmentation problem. If you think of this as segmenting an image. The way they do this is really beautiful. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm kind of in love with the elegance of this, maybe more than I love its effectiveness because unfortunately they had to sort of back off in some of the elegance to make it effective. But the general idea is they take every, they train a network to create an embedding, which is to say for every point in that spectrogram, every time frequency point, they map it to a vector in some abstract space and then they, they train the network to learn how to do that, that mapping. And afterwards, they, uh, they do that mapping in such a way that it uh, clusters together the vectors that belong to the speakers. So in, in here we've got red, blue, green, those are three speakers, and you can see there's clusters there. It's a totally made up example, but that's, that's the general idea. Um, the diagram you're seeing here with the uh, clusters, this is actually a two speaker uh, mixture, and these are the actual clusters that they get out of it. So the beautiful thing is um, you get these embedded vectors, you look for the clusters, that tells you how, uh, well, first of all, you find there's two clusters. So you know there's two speakers. You look at kind of the centroid of those clusters. You look at the assignment of those dots to the, the clusters. That tells you, if you think back to your spectrogram, uh, which point belongs to which speaker. So then you create a mask. Do I have a picture of a mask? No. Um, but you create a mask, uh, which you apply to original spectrogram. This is the speaker one mask. This is where speaker one is dominant, because our clusters told us that. You just set everything else to zero, then you reproduce the, uh, go back to the time domain using that spectrogram. So let me, let me show you what this, what this sounds like. So here's the mixture. July delivering platinum surged $30.10 before selling at $622.90 an ounce, comma, up $12, period. So that was two clean recordings of people just smashed together. And even you're listening carefully to that, it's, it's hard to, Hard to tease out what they're saying. All right, here's after the separation, speaker one. The mid hyphen July increase came even though automakers are offering incentives on fewer cars this year than they did last year or earlier this year. I don't know how well you could hear about that, but that was way, way more intelligible. It was a very good suppression of the other speaker. Let's hear speaker two. July delivery platinum surged $13.10 before settling at $622.90 an ounce, comma, up $12, period. It's not super high quality speech, but very intelligible. That's, that's a super impressive result. And if you listen to other source separation techniques that preceded this, this is a dramatic, dramatic improvement. I think it's one of the most impressive. Was that a blind? Was that blind? Was that was blind, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, they, they trained it on a set of speakers. The test examples we're hearing here are from not in the training set. But you, you trained them, did you train them? Um, well, they, they used the individual speakers as ground truth for the training, for sure, yes, yes. I'm going, to, I'm going to do one more of those because I like those. Let's see this one. He Mr. said this product could be marketed by other companies with experience in that business. Proposal in hand. Mr. Plaskett told union leaders he believes he could have a firm proposal in hand. He said such products would be marketed by other companies with experience in that business. So you might not be thrilled with the quality of the sound that comes out, but if you fed that now into a, like a speech recognition system, it probably wouldn't have much trouble with it. It doesn't care about a little bit of scratchiness. So that, that was impressive. 
Uh, that was all done with a, a spectral uh, spectrograms, magnitude, the phases all just mashed up in the way I t described before. Uh, people are doing this in the time domain as well. I don't, uh, sadly, they didn't post any examples. So I can't play any of that for you. Music voice separation, this uh, to me falls in the category of uh, toy problems, but um, there's some real interesting work, which I don't have time to talk about. But some people at Spotify who have access to like huge amounts of music in their database, um, including apparently uh, when artists release a song, they'll also release just the instrumental track. So they just comb through the database to get millions of examples of speech plus or vocal plus music and music alone. They train this thing to separate them out the results are pretty good. Um, they are, they used a magnitude spectrogram for their work in this UNET structure. I wrote to the authors and said, how about a compact spectrogram? And they said, yes, that's the next thing we're doing. So that'll be interesting. I'm not going to do that. I'll briefly mention beamforming. Uh, this is the idea where you have multiple microphones. Uh, one, one thing that's very interesting about sound that you don't have with imagery is that sound comes at us from all directions. You don't have to be pointed particularly to hear it. But if you are pointed somewhere and you've got, you know, you've got two ears or you've got multiple microphones, you can get uh, differential gain depending on whether you're pointing at the sound source or not. There are uh, beamformings of well-established technique. There's lots of sort of fixed algorithms to calculate the beamforming. I always assumed it was going to be a pre-processing step. So if you've got a hearing aid, most hearing aids, by the way, have a couple of microphones in each ear, not just one. Um, so you've got, you've got a microphone array to work with there. Uh, I assume that you would do, again, this kind of fixed pre-processing stage with beamforming to, before you feed it into something else. Uh, this paper that's mentioned at the bottom here, um, does, they learn the beamforming in a network. So now the, they're much more an end-to-end -end process because even that front-end stuff is, is part of it. Okay, the last one I want to talk about, and then I want to say something about hearing aids specifically in the last couple of minutes, is uh, VQVAE. So these are the WaveNet folks again. Love that WaveNet guy. Uh, and um, it's kind of a complicated paper. This one just came out. But basically what he's doing for both imagery and, and speech is doing this kind of bottleneck type of architecture again. And if you think about uh, what you get at the bottom of that U in the UNet, where uh, you've got that kind of choke point there. He's describing the information that you've got there as, as latent variables. Let's just call them latent variables. So he, he takes, uh, in, in this picture is showing an image. We're going to do it for sound. You take your input, you encode it into these uh, latent variables, and then you decode it into something else. So what's the relevance for us is, well, I'll play you this, and then I'll tell you what's going on. We are encouraged by the news. We are encouraged by the news. And I won't play all the other examples, but so what happened there? So he had a recording of a person. He encoded it, and then he decoded it, but he decoded it with somebody else's voice. So he's transferred the speech from one, one person to another, and it kept much of the same cadence and, and that kind of stuff. You'll see in a minute why I think that's so important. Okay. Toward a better hearing aid. So what have we seen so far today, or heard, uh, lots of good progress on many fundamental tasks that we care about for audio. Lots more work to do, but the early results are definitely encouraging. I would say it's, it's fair to say the quality is not spectacular yet, uh, except this text-to-speech stuff. That's pretty darn good. Um, but the accuracy, the intelligibility is often better, and like an automatic speech recognition system would probably benefit a lot from these techniques. So my thoughts on a hearing aid is, if we're so good at ASR and we're so good at, at text-to-speech, why don't, why don't we admit that and uh, combine them combine them together? So here's a couple of options for a processing chain having to do with a, a hearing aid. And there, there's two options here, uh, the yellow path along the top and this green path at the bottom. So you start with your input sounds. It's just picked up by the microphones, uh, the ambient sound. You do some sort of beamforming. You'll do that source separation we talked about because you really want to focus in on a particular person you're listening to. You'll end up with then the isolated source. There's a little bit of a question of how you pick out the source you're interested in, but let's just assume that we know which one we care about. And then what do you do with that? You've got this isolated source, which is kind of this scratchy, not, not spectacularly high-quality sound, perhaps. 
well, you could enhance it. You could do this path. You just try to make it sound better and better. You create the output sound, and you hope that the person wearing the hearing aid, that you've done a good enough job that they can uh, now understand what, what was being said, whereas before they couldn't. And that's kind of what hearing aids do now. One way or another, they enhance the sound. I, I don't think that's ever going to be spectacularly successful, just as the current hearing aids are not spectacularly successful today. The alternative would be to do a little bit more what we just saw with this VQVA thing. Because you take that isolated source and then you encode it. It's probably going to be a little bit insensitive to the noise and the artifacts that came through the source separation and, and so on. You encode it to this latent space and then you resynthesize the voice. And that's what you feed to the hearing aid. So the idea is the hearing aid is something that completely blocks out the ambient sound. All you hear is the soundscape that we create for you. But the, there's microphones there that are listening. They get this sound. They separate out the thing that's of interest, encode it, and then resynthesize it. So what you're hearing is now a synthesized voice. Hearing loss is often a, a case where you, uh, you need some frequency compensation because you're, you have differential response at different frequencies. So fine, you, you can do that. You can make that synthesized voice anything you want. It can be very tuned to the particular nature of the hearing loss that the person has. So lots of people told me I'm uh, crazy to think about this yellow path uh, as the way to go, but um, I think it's, it's high risk, but the more promising one uh, in the end to work. So that's, that's my case for that. Uh, a bit of evidence that it might work, who knows? Uh, we're getting to the stage where you can have automatic translation in your ears. So Google has announced their, their Google Pixel Buds. You put them on and it'll translate, not exactly simultaneously, but close to uh, real time from one language to another. So there, the latent representation is the, the words of the language. Here's one language, represents it as something else, and then synthesizes a voice in a different language. There's a, another uh, product called the My Menu Click, which I got my order in for that, uh, and the Google Buds as well. So I haven't tried any, either of these. OK, wrapping up. Um, I have lots of recommendations for deep learning audio researchers. There's a lot to learn from the ImageNet experience, not from the algorithms, but the experience of doing that and the success of that, that competition. Uh, please, please, please get your training data out from behind paywalls. I keep trying to reproduce results in papers, and they keep benchmarking against stuff that I don't have access to. It's just dumb. Open it up, please. The, this stuff's available. Uh, get your papers out from behind the paywalls, too. Archive.org is where everything is. It's getting better, but... I'm looking at you, IEEE. <coughs> um, publish more examples of your output. Don't put out a paper about how you've done a great job cleaning up audio, and then don't give any examples. That's not convincing. Uh, it's, it's a little bit brave to put out these examples when the results are preliminary and early, and you know, many people will listen and say, well, that sounds like not very high quality. In fact, it's, you, you gotta do it. Publish more code. Publish your train models. Don't just put code out there and say, you know, it took us two weeks to train this, and here's the thing, and now you can train it. Like, I don't have two weeks to try to retrain it. And contribute to deep learning frameworks. If you want to do this transfer learning by using a pre-trained image net network, you can do that in two lines of code in Keras. If you want to do any of this audio stuff, you're, you've got a much, uh, a much more of an uphill battle. Now, I claim I was going to try to recruit you into working on deep learning for audio. You should. Why should you care about this? Well, there's a rich source of really interesting problems here. I think you've seen some of those today, and there's many, many more. There's lots of low-hanging fruit. Um, I mean, uh, literally, every, as I was preparing this, and I realized, oh, there's sort of a gap here. I wonder if anyone's thinking about that. Sometimes they are. Sometimes a paper would appear that day that somebody's thinking about it. It's, there's lots. There's training data is readily available. You can't say that about lots of other data science problems. Uh, the early results, I think, are promising. I, I, think, I hope you've heard things today that you, you thought were interesting. The field is just generally less crowded. Let's face it, if you're doing some image thing, or you've got lots of people doing that, and they, they're getting a lot of uh, marketing oomph from what they're doing. But finally, the problems are really important. I think making a better hearing aid, uh, and you want, want to hear me talk about that for an hour, making a better hearing aid is, is a super important thing that uh, we could all be contributing to as a deep learning community. That's it. Thank you.